Hello all, we are happy to have you all here with us for our fifth event in the series entitled Multiplying Our Images of God, co-sponsored by the Chapel Institute for Spirituality and Social Justice on Xavier University's campus. Unfortunately, in recording this event, we missed the introduction provided by our host, Dr. Bill Matches. So in order to provide some framing for the recording, I will give a short introduction and then we'll jump into Dr. Algren's talk. Our host this evening is Dr. Bill Madges, Bellarmine Parishioner and Chair of the Theology Department and Director of the Brueggemann Center at Xavier University. The series was put together as part of a focus on active discipleship and has been coordinated by lay members of our social mission core team, worship core team, and staff in collaboration with the theological partners at the Institute for Spirituality and Social Justice. Originally, we convened to discuss the need to multiply our images of God beyond the traditional masculine images like Father, King, and Lord, as found in much of the Catholic prayer and liturgy. As the team talked, however, we recognized there were still bigger questions we wanted to explore together to expand our own understandings of God. The hope is that by multiplying our images of God, that is by understanding how different traditions within and outside Catholicism understand and talk about God using both human and more than human terms, that our individual and community life might be enriched. This lecture series is not meant to make any particular proclamations about the nature of God, but rather to spur dialogue around these topics. It will culminate in a mini retreat on April 2nd. Now to introduce our speaker, Jillian T.W. Algren, is Professor Emerita of Theology at Xavier University and is known internationally for her scholarship on the Christian mystical tradition. She has written extensively on figures such as Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, Francis Sinclair of Assisi, and Julian of Norwich. Some of her books include The Tenderness of God, Reclaiming Our Humanity, Enkindling Love, The Legacy of Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross, and The Spiritual Exercises for the 21st Century, a workbook. Over the past 12 years, her pastoral experience with the underserved survivors of domestic violence, women in recovery for substance abuse, have helped her tap into the vitality of this tradition, as well as a wellspring to support change and growth. And now for our, our speaker. Thank you. Um, and that easily um, supplement some of the more narrow images that we have of God. Um, but rather than focusing on the images, I wanted to give you phrases and words suggestive of the vitality of God and the active presence of God as God has made God's self known relationally. So I studied with Bernard McGinn, who's commonly considered the leading expert in defining mysticism and mysticism. And in his original book, he wrote a six volume series on the mystical tradition in Christianity. He wrote, rather than defining mysticism, I prefer to discuss it as a process or a way of life. Mysticism is the attempt to express a direct consciousness of the presence of God. So that phrase, the direct consciousness of the presence of God, soon became the kind of the the coin uh, uh, or the realm in the in in the in the theological world, the way that people began to understand mysticism. Bernie went on to say that the mystical element in Christianity is that part of its belief and practices that concerns the preparation for, the consciousness of and the reaction to the immediate or direct presence of God. So how do we prepare to experience God directly? What happens when we become aware of that direct presence of God? And what is our response to that presence of God? And that's how Bernie defined the mysticism and the entire mystical tradition. As I think of the mystical life, I, I consider it the, the sum total of our desire to know God's presence in daily life, the many ways that we seek that presence as a consolation, as a, a sense of comfort, as a source of strength, as the source of inspiration, um, as a companionate presence. And so we really learn the God of relationship, and that God is a relational God in this mystical realm. So through prayer, through encounter, moment by moment, as we learn God's love and we try to magnify God's love in all that we do, we too participate in the mystical life. The mystical life is something that all Christians are invited into. Um, in, in effect, 
if, if there's a simple takeaway from tonight, um, the mystics teach us that God is invitation, that God continually invites new things out of us individually and communally. And so we le really learn the, the, that God is not just noun, but verb, continually inviting more out of us. So you may know some of these uh, friends of God. Um, I've got some pictures and some names here. Francis of Assisi here on the left, uh, top left, Claire of Assisi next to him. Collaboratively, um, these two sparked a revolution in the early 13th century as the rise of urban life created a new awareness of um, the ways that the poor were falling through the cracks of society and Christianity had a responsibility, a moral responsibility um, to accompany those who were not provided for in society. And so a huge reform of the early 13th century stimulated by urbanization in the 12th that Francis and Claire spearheaded. Um, below them, Teresa of Avila on the left, Ignatius of Loyola on the right, John of the Cross not um, pictured here, but then on the bottom, 20th century, I consider 20th century figures, Oscar Romero on the left and Dorothy Day on the right, contemporary mystics. In all of these people, we can literally see the ways that relationship with God changed them over time. They lived out a deepening relationship with God that changed them and that changed the world around them. One of the great uh, lessons um, of the mystics, and they say it in many, many different ways, this particular phrase from John of the Cross's uh, living flame of love is a beautiful example of it, but they always talk about how we cannot truly know ourselves without knowing God, and that we cannot know God without trying to understand and know ourselves, and that that task of knowing self and knowing God is a complex one that takes a lifetime, um, and that God's um, presence is sometimes hidden to us, but that we and God share something, and that what we share is both a desire to be in relationship with one another, and a desire to know and be known, to love and be loved. And so you could say that our longing for God, whenever we sense or feel that, is a small echo of God's greater longing for us. And I think it's really, really important for us never to forget that God longs for us, longs for us um, in all senses of that word, longs for a connection and relationship, but also longs to share life with us in a, an intimate and quotidian, routine, ordinary, daily way. And so John of the Cross tells us in the first place, it should be known that if a person is seeking God, her beloved is seeking her much more. And you can see this beautiful um, painting called The Hidden God um, in the center there by one of the residents of House of Peace in Chicago. And you'll be able to tell from the colorful uh, paintings um, when some of these um, images from House of Peace come up. So how do we come to know this God more intimately? How do we form a deepening relationship with this God? And um, mystics will tell us that the gateway, the passageway, the opening, the door way to relationship with God is prayer. And this is going to, in effect, um, require us to explore our sense, uh, our uh, uh, definition of prayer. I took the active definition of prayer from Teresa of Avila's way of perfection up there at the top. Prayer is nothing more than frequent conversation with the one whom we know loves us. The one whom we know loves us. So God, by definition, provides a safe space for us to share ourselves. We could and probably should think of prayer then as a full self-disclosure, a presentation of self to self in that intimate way of two fingers, two hands coming together. And that 
um, the practice of prayer should become um, both familiar and habitual to us, that we shouldn't wait until our lives feel perfect <laughs> to approach God in prayer. But rather, just like the um, people of the Hebrew Bible as reflected in the Psalms. So, you know, those of you who know the Psalms know how the Psalms, gosh, all you have to do is flip through them and you'll see a catalog of human emotions, right? That there is longing, there is rejoicing, there is grieving, there's lamenting, like lament in terms of the unfairness or injustice of life. There's pondering, there's wondering, there's so many things happening in the Psalms, and that's suggestive of what our own lives of prayer should be like, that there is no emotion that is unsafe to share with God. Um, there's no question that's um, beyond our capacity to ask God, and that our, our relationship with God becomes infinitesimally richer with each emotion, with each concern, with each grief, with each question, uh, with each joy that we share with God, with a kind of familiarity. On the right side of the screen, there's another lovely invitation to explore the definition of prayer by um, scholar um, of spirituality, Christian spirituality, Henry Nouwen, who says, precisely because prayer is personal, and arises from the center of our life, which is a lovely way to think of it. Is your prayer arising from the center of your life? You know, are you sharing the center, the depth, the intimacy of you with God? But interestingly, now it says precisely because prayer arises from the center of our life, it is to be shared with others, not just to be reserved for private time with God. Precisely because prayer is the most precious expression of being human, it needs the constant support and protection of the community to grow and to flower. I know that in the periods of my life that have been either the driest or the most challenging, the support, the prayerful support of others reaches in like a circle, almost like a web of support a net, a safety net. And I think that's part of what uh, Nowen is getting at, that prayer is not simply individual, but communal. And um, it's by communal, we don't mean only that we pray together, but that we pray for one another in words and in, in and intention, as well as silently as silent witnesses to the journeys that each one of us is on. Um, I want to think about or hold up one of the, a, a reflection from Bernard of Clairvaux, um, a, a 12, an important 12th century mystic, who wrote a text called On Loving God. And in that text, um, Bernard of Clairvaux talks about four stages in growing toward God uh, and toward a collaborative partnership with God that takes shape as we share more of ourselves in prayer. And so he says, and, and is, as he's speaking about uh, prayer, he says, you know, it's very easy and obvious that when we as humans run up against limitation, we, we want to seek the one whom we think can help us. And so what Bernard of Clairvaux basically saw in his own experience, but also taught others, was that our human need, rather than serving as a source of frustration for us, can be a blessing in disguise. In fact, it is a blessing in disguise if we choose to share our vulnerability with God. So the, uh, the, the quote on the top, it is important for us to know what we can do by ourselves and what we need God's help to accomplish. In other words, every time we run up against the wall of human limitation, we do actually have someone who knows us better than we know ourselves, knows our limitation, and also knows how to be there for us in ways that might help us see our realities a bit differently. 
And so Bernard continues, when our tribulations grow and we turn more frequently to God, only to find God already there, will we invoke God more often and approach God more frequently? And will the familiarity of God help us to taste and see God's goodness? So here, Bernard of Clairvaux is actually asking us, you know, to use our vulnerability and our limitation as human beings as an invitation to deepening honesty and candor with God and deepening relationship with God. There's a lovely little quote here, too, from Augustine. Yesterday, you understood a little. Today, you understand better. Tomorrow, you will understand better still. The light of God is growing in you. And I guess I want to double back and just highlight that this growth is not inevitable. This growth is a byproduct of deepening familiarity with God, deepening our conscious relationship with God. And the more that we commit to the discipline of that relationship, the more broadly, deeply, and generously are we going to experience God's longing for us and God's desire to be present for us and with us in this world. So Jillian, you're about halfway done. Awesome. Thank you very much. I think I'm going to, I think I'm on target. I was going to go to a, um, you know, a, a core um, description or understanding of human nature that comes to us from the very first book of the Bible in Genesis, in which we are told that we are created in the image and likeness of God. The mystics help us to see that the image of God in which we are created is a living image. It's not a dead image. It's not a fixed image. It's not something static. Rather, it's a living image, and we can certainly think of it as a spark of divine love. And so we should, um, as Teresa of Avila reminds us, remember that within us is a palace of immense beauty. The image of God that resides within us is almost like a kaleidoscope ever changing in its fabric and, it, and in its mystery, and that it's well worth our time to not only go in and explore our inner world and that image within us, but always to do that in light of the love of God in whom we are in increasing and potentially even constant conversation. Mystics explore the reality that there is a spark of God alive in us. And um, it's not always easy to explore what is within us. In fact, sometimes, depending on what we have lived through in our lives, um, and depending on um, the world around us, we can begin to have almost more fear of what we're going to discover in our aloneness or even in the world around us, rather than turning in conversation to God about those fears. So there's this wonderful quote from Thomas Merton, we fear to be alone and to be ourselves, and so to remind others of the truth that is in them. Mystics basically understand that the journey to truth and the journey to the God within is a long process. It's not necessarily straightforward. And we may well come upon uncomfortable truths as we journey toward that deepest truth. But they want to affirm the journey and they certainly want to affirm the goodness of the living God who dwells within us. And so the quote from Teresa here, the things of the soul must always be considered as plentiful, spacious, and large. To think of them that way is not an exaggeration, for the soul is capable of much more than we can imagine, and the light of God within us shines in all parts. As we attune ourselves to God's presence through colloquy, meditation, and even for a simple practice like um, contemplating the world around us and deepening our reverence for creation, 
we begin to become more aware of that presence in daily life. The mystics really invite us through their own experience and model and example, um, but also through the reminders that they leave for us in their texts, that we have the capacity to experience the presence and the vitality and the love of God. So here, this beautiful quote from Henry Nouwen, each day holds a surprise, but only if we expect it can we see, hear, or feel it when it comes to us? Let us not be afraid to receive each day's surprise, whether it comes to us as sorrow or as joy. It will open a new place in our hearts, a place where we can welcome new friends and celebrate more fully our shared humanity. So if prayer is one place where we can uh, have a safe place for exploring and experiencing the presence of God, encounter with others is another tremendously important realm. And so I wanted to just take a very quick freeze frame close up view of the lives of uh, Francis and Claire, who explored and opened up for Christianity, the reality of the incarnation. The reality that God is present and vitally alive in the world around us and certainly in one another, in humanity. So as Julian of Norwich, um, the English mystic who lived later than them, uh, Francis and Claire said, every natural comp compassion which one has for one's fellow Christians in love is Christ in us. And this impulse of love, this like divine impulse of love, was something that Francis himself experienced in a very surprising way at a very particular moment in his life. After he had returned back to Assisi from being a prisoner of war for a full year, and while he was unsure about how to reintegrate into the world, he found himself drawn to a place outside the city walls, a leper colony which had, was understood in his day and age as really a, a place of death. People went to leper colonies to die a slow, usually isolated and almost lingering death. And it was a place that most people avoided. But Francis tells us in his last will and testament that it was God, God's self, who drew Francis into this space that he expected to be very frightening. And to his surprise, Francis found himself full of love, of compassion, of desire to simply be there companionately and very presently to those who had been abandoned by his fellow sisters and brothers in Assisi. And it was in the leper colony that Francis himself felt almost a wellspring of love. And he knew that it was such a deep love that it was a love that was coming from someplace deeper than himself. In effect, as I understand this experience in Francis's life, this was when Francis experienced the living God through this wellspring of love that stimulated and drew and moved him to simply be present lovingly to another person and then as a way of remaining faithful to the, to the people in the leper colony, the abandoned ones that he met there, and to his sisters and brothers in the leper colony, and also to the God who came alive in their midst, Francis um, turned his back on the class structure and the society up in the um, hillside city of Assisi and began a very simple, and humble practice of accompaniment. And really, um, when Pope Francis talks about the power and the mystery of encounter, I think really Francis and this example in the leper colony gives us a, a profound example of that coming alive, of God's coming alive in the spaces between us. So it's not simply that God comes alive in the space between us and God. It's also that God comes alive in the spaces in, between us and the human community. 
Um, so as I explore this practice of presence and the way that presence was ex uh, the presence of God was experienced by Francis, but also in the human community around Francis and Claire as they sought to cultivate community, I've got a couple of quotes here from um, my book, The Tenderness of God, Reclaiming Our Humanity. And I think post-pandemic particularly, um, where we ourselves are deeply immersed in and should be invested in this process of reclaiming our humanity, um, reclaiming the things that make life humane, the, 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 good, the kind and good and generous qualities that we have and courageous qualities that we have as human beings and that mm, are enkindled in us through our relationship with God. So the process of recognizing God's presence, oops, in our midst is as countercultural and even revolutionary as it is subtle, profound, and thorough. It is a revolution of tenderness that rewrites what it means to be human. So think about it. We're constantly creating and, are, and changing and shifting in our understanding of what it means to be human. And the more that we allow God to illuminate that sense of what it means to be human, the, the better, the more humane we can become. It begins with the piercing recognition of God asking us for help in the face of those who suffer injustice. Engaging the other with the intention to listen, to learn, and to connect is a mutually transformative practice that slowly changes everything. And counter teaches us to honor the fragility and sacredness of our own humanity, especially as we come to know our common humanity together. When this is done in the conscious presence of the love of God, encounter creates sacred space in the human community. Uh, put another way, encounter moves us from being observers of life to collaborators with God in the building up of the human community, the creation of a common home. So I said before that mystics help us to understand God as verb. They help us to appreciate the dynamism of God and that we have within us a tremendous capacity to be transformed. We can't, as human beings, necessarily transform ourselves in all of the ways that we might want. We need the help of God to do that, but we can be transformed. We journey best together, and God wants to make us partners with God in God's goodwill and work together in the human community. So all of this brings us to a phrase uh, that I, or one of the phrases that I like to explore, creative fidelity. We know fidelity is the process of being faithful, right? But what do the mystics teach us about that? Well, they teach us that fidelity is certainly not um, something that we can do by following a set of principles. Rather, fidelity emerges as we are faithful to the presence of God and to the needs of God in the human community. So as we explore that presence of God, we begin mm, to learn to inhabit more creatively the world around us with God. So we reach out for God, for inspiration, for strength, for courage, for hope, so that we can continue to be instruments of God's presence in the world. I'm going to skip these, um, uh, you know, developing the ways that we can explore this transformative capacity that we might call metanoia, the reign of God that Jesus preached, but solidarity, resistance, growth, and flourishing. Those are all um, nouns uh, that have of, of kind of a vibrant and communal dimension to them. And this, these are the, the and communities of metanoia are precisely what the mystical life helps us to explore. Claiming the uniqueness of our relationship with God requires both a kind of solitude um, that allows us the quiet to sense and come to know the presence of God within us and around us, 
but it also requires trustworthy companionship. People that we can talk to about what we're learning. And as we become aware of places inside us that need healing or where we need to grow, we can have conversations with them for support and encouragement and even accountability. Five more minutes, there, Julian. All Five right, more. I think I've got four more slides. So hopefully we're gonna make it creative. So in the creative fidelity, right? And the mystical life of the community, of the Christian community is by growing into our capacity for tenderness. Here's a beautiful quote from Henry Nowen. Once in a while, we meet a gentle person, one who does not break the crushed reed or snuff the faltering wick. What does that mean? Well, all right, let's try again. A gentle person is attentive to the strengths and weaknesses of the other and enjoys being together more than accomplishing something. In fact, accomplishment for, this, for the gentle person, but the person who is trying to be, uh, to be a part of loving community, uh, accomplishment and success is simply to be with, right? A gentle person treads lightly, listens carefully, looks tenderly, and touches with reverence. A gentle person knows that true growth requires nurture, not force. In our tough and unbending world, our gentleness can be a vivid reminder of the presence of God among us. And here's another beautiful reminder from Jewish rabbi Michael Lerner. Treat other human beings as if you believed that they were created in the image of God, which, of course, you would profess right, as a Christian. Recognize them as precious, unique, and wonderful, most of all for what they share in common with one another, their capacities for love, caring, intelligence, freedom, creating beauty, and responding to the glory of the universe. Hurry to promote tenderness and gentleness throughout all human interactions and speedily find strategies to undermine the tendencies of people to blame themselves and feel unworthy. Suffuse the world with loving energy. And I think if we can get through these last couple of slides here, we'll end, yep, yeah, good. Two more slides. So I hope that this simple PowerPoint and the Voices of Mystics has served as something of a reminder to you. And um, with this reminder, I hope that you too will become someone who reminds others because that truly as uh, followers of Christ and as people created in the image and likeness of God with that living spark of love within us, we are reminders of God's constancy of God's creativity, of God's tenderness, filling in gaps and spaces where trauma has dislodged God's lavishness and ubiquity, has shattered not just us, but our awareness of God's presence and the goodness that it ignites, disconnecting us from that beautiful and God-given capacity to be bearers of light and love in our world. So every time that we are able to bear light or love into some space in our world, we are testifying to a source of light and love way beyond us. And so we are light bearers, not just reminders and memory keepers. We are active. We, what we remember is living, alive, present, and future-oriented, vectored toward a world that is home for all. It's certainly my sense that some of the precious reminders we have of uh, the mystics past and present can help us in that journey and in that task. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to leave you with questions, right? I think they're in the chat. I'll turn it back over to you, Bill. Yeah, thank you very much, Joanne, for sharing with us your insights uh, and the insights of the mystics of our tradition and the ways they can help us to connect and to recognize uh, and to nurture the aliveness and presence of God in us, in those around us, and in the world. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to break into small groups, and you'll have about 20 minutes uh, in those breakout rooms to discuss the presentation and these questions. So Jillian first showed them in a slide. Ashley has put them in the chat, but I'd also like to read them again so that they're really fresh in your mind. So here are the three questions. 
What if any of the insights from mystics spoke to you or made you curious? What practices help you to know God's presence, to remember, reconnect with God's presence in you and in the world around you? And finally, what are some of the most consoling and strengthening ways that you have known God's presence? What have they taught you about God? And I think this would be kind of a precious time for you to share your, your reflections and answers to those questions with the members in your small group. Talk about your, your small group. Yeah, go ahead, Liz. Hi. Um, yeah, so uh, in my group, um, we talked a bit about um, some of the insights that the mystics had that really spoke to us. Um, and so I mentioned the quote from St. John of the Cross about uh, the beloved seeking us just as much as we are seeking uh, the beloved. And that resonated with me because it, I feel like it relates very much to my own life story at this moment in time um, where I feel this call to serve the church in some way. And while I don't know what that looks like um, at this moment, uh, I know that it is unfurling somehow um, and God is guiding me on that path um, as I pursue God and God pursues me. Um, and then one of my uh, other team members, Lori, um, shared a beautiful story about um, these seeds that she had um, for the garden. And she said that she was looking at them and uh, she had this realization that each plant um, is its own, it's unique and it has endless opportunities. Um, and I think that really speaks to a lot about um, what Dr. Algren was speaking about tonight as well. Good, thank you for sharing. Others? Things that resonated uh, with you or someone in your small group that you would be willing to share? Just one small suggestion. Um, I, I really love the, uh, well, first of all, hi to everyone. I think most of you I recognize. <laughs> And I was with you in spirit on uh, on Sunday at the game. Um, <laughs> we, you, you might want to, um, Jillian had some beautiful quotes from Henry Nouwen. And if you're interested, you know, if you, many of you must know about this already, but the, the Henry Nouwen Society uh, is sends an email out every single day, morning. And um, it has a nice juicy, like two or three paragraph quote from, one of Henry Nouwen's books, kind of like the beautiful quotes that Jillian had. And I find it a very, very, a wonderful way to start the day um, with that. So I'm sure if you just put henrynowen.org, you'll, it'll come up and then you could subscribe and it's free and you get it every day. And it's always, it's, they're just, I don't know, they seem to be chosen just very wisely. And, uh, like the ones Jillian, and they're just, I stays with you the whole day, so. Thank you. Our group about how often now when talking about community, um, he apparently had a hard time finding a place where he felt he really fit until close to the end of his life when he moved into this community with uh, intellectually challenged adults and he felt he didn't have to perform for them or he wasn't judged. He could just be himself. I thought that was really telling. Thank you. Other reflections, thoughts? things that resonated with you, made you more curious, comments that one of your uh, partners in the small group said that uh, struck you? Yeah, go ahead, Linda. Uh, and there were four persons in our group, and each of us shared that um, we had had some mystical experiences that we could uh, identify when we found ourselves in situations where we were just overcome with awe and the grandeur of God, and sometimes in very ordinary situations, 
and our ordinary surroundings. And um, just given a minute, we could have gone on and on because within a minute's time, everybody was saying, oh yes, I remember when. And um, so is that something that perhaps people have just not claimed for themselves? Is this something that we have relegated to um, the great mystics? Or is having these mystical experiences something very ordinary that's, that's just there for the rest of us? Is that a rhetorical question? <laughs> well, I'd love for you to chime in if you'd like. <laughs> Well, certainly, uh, you know, my one of my go-to mystics, as some of you already know, is Teresa of Avila. I've written a lot on her, and um, actually, my middle, my first middle initial is Teresa, whose name I took when I was confirmed. Um, and she would say that we are all of us called to be mystics. And in in fact, um, her she wrote books that a quote unquote good nun, an obedient nun, quote unquote, would not have written. She wrote during the span of time of the Spanish Inquisition when there was a very serious suspicion of people's of the capacity of ordinary human beings to experience God. And she wrote stimulated by this sense that a being a mystic is the call of every human being. Um, it's part and parcel of our relationship with God. And so we need support and encouragement, um, correction from time to time, you know, when we get things wrong or we kind of fumble the ball or whatever, but um, that ultimately we need encouragement and support in nurturing not only a relationship with God, but also the capacity, the eyes to see to recognize. Um, and we need support to kind of discipline ourselves to look for God. Because um, one of the quotes that I had on there was about, you know, you, you need to, you need to, st to stay open, you need to, it said expect, um, which when you think about um, the in the Spanish, you know, you could also say anticipate, hope for, um, esperar uh, is, you know, to expect, to anticipate, to wait for, um, but you, you know, that, that sense that we do need to be open to the surprises of God, to the ironies of life, and to the many, many ways that God is constantly showing up, and, um, and that we have choices, and we can, we can choose to be blind to that. We can choose to be non-responsive, and I'm afraid that we see that at least as often as you know, the cultivation of the tendency of the mystical tendency, you know, or of our capacity to live toward God. So I'm glad that you raised that, Linda. I think it's, I think on the one hand, we all have the mystical vocation. We're all called to be mystics. And in fact, Carl Rahner said that the Christian of the 21st century either will, will be either a mystic or not at all. You know, that what keeps Christianity alive, what keeps our relationship with God vital is our openness to the experience of God daily. Um, so it is possible, but it's not inevitable. That's one of the things I wanted also to make sure that I left as something of a takeaway. We want it, but, but you know, we, I, I'll speak for myself, right? And maybe some of you will nod along with me. I want 82 things in a single day. Am I going to center my life around what is best for me and what I most deeply want, which I hope is God. And, but, and am I going to do so in a way that's not distracted by the other things that might be calling for my attention? So this relationship with God that we can cultivate is not inevitable. And it does take um, a discipline, a regularity, a set of habits, and a community of support in order to really grow into it. I'm wondering, though, about uh, children, young children, who have such a natural curiosity and often when they recognize something that's bigger than they are, will just say, oh, wow. So I'm wondering, is that something much maybe like our imagination that we, that we are gifted with, but that somehow we lose it and have to, to work to regain it? 
Yeah, I think that's part of what I often think about as the habit, you know, of God that we be, can become habituated toward um, the cultivation of awe and wonder and mystery and delight and surprise uh, in our lives. And we can also habituate ourselves to uh, contempt, disdain, uh, despair, uh, you know, all kinds of, uh, you know, or, or, or sarcasm you know, or these, the ways that we can kind of in almost cutting, um, almost cutting ways, cut off the grace and the connection. So the spontaneity and the joy and even the wonder of children can, has a lot to teach us. Um, and, you know, uh, yeah, it has a lot to teach us. It, it may be inappropriate for the moderator to add a word, but both Linda's comment and then Jillian's response uh, makes me think of a line that perhaps many of you are familiar with from the Acts of the Apostles, which talks about, you know, that we, with regard to God, we live and move and have our being in God. And if you think about that, so what Jillian was making this point of uh, understanding mysticism as a, a kind of as a direct awareness, a direct consciousness of God in a conversation with God, I think sometimes people may think that mystical experience is only in the extraordinary. And if you think about that, namely, think about how do we live each day? How do we move? And in, in, in what way and from what source do we have our being? There's a real, if you will, ordinariness to it, which, and I think this picks up on Joanne's point, that it's pretty easy to, to ignore or to not recognize. And I think that was your point about sharpening a sense to appreciate God's presence and the ordinariness of life. I think uh, there, though... Yeah, no, I was going to say, are there other, other comments or reflections? Dan, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think one other, at least I found in my life, I think sometimes the, res the resistance we may have to acknowledge the fact that each of us houses heaven's fire in, is that if we really acknowledge that and embrace it, it's going to transform us. And I think deep down, I, I think... In, in in different times of my life, I know there I I've, I haven't especially been longing for a transformation. You know, in other words, I I'd like to be in control, and uh, so I think that's one of the reasons we don't kind of delve into the mystic life, or the, the the become friends, more intimate friends of God, is because we know that just like any other real friendship in life, right? If, if you take it seriously, it transforms you. Well, so much so a, a, a friendship with God, it's going to change and maybe in, in big major ways. And uh, I think that might be one subtle way, either consciously or maybe unconsciously, that we sort of keep a distance so that we can also keep control. Maybe I'm wrong. I just think. Oh, and, and Teresa of Avila makes that point very clearly in her interior castle, you know, where she talks about um, she talks about how we there's a there's there's a point, and she actually um, likens it to the passage about it's harder for a, a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven than a camel to pass through the eye of the needle. Well, for her, it's not about rich or poor, it's about um, the extent to which we are willing to walk companionately with God and that, and that that's the, that's the point, that's the eye of the needle, you know, that saying yes to that and saying yes to all that, that how, all of the ways that that is going to transform us, it's going to make, it's kind of like that beautiful, um, poem, wasn't it, Arupe, it's not really a poem, but, you know, the falling in love poem mm. in which, you know, it's, that's going to determine what wakes you up <laughs> and what, what helps you get out of bed in the morning, what keeps you up at night, what, you know, and so, you know, a relationship with God is going to mean that God's concerns, you're not going to be able to ignore God's concerns, you know, the, the things that, that, that God worries about might keep you up or might trouble you as well. You're going to, your sensitivities are going to increase and that that's not always the easiest space to maintain and sustain unless, and unless 
you um, continue in your the kind of the constancy of your companionship with God. So in the interior castle, which has like seven stages of intensifying commitment and depth in your relationship with God, there's this space between the third and the fourth. And the third dwelling places is for all the people who follow the Ten Commandments. You know, they're good people. They're decent people. They're they're the volunteers in this society and this, you know, organization, and they're always ushering at church, and they're always around, and they're trustworthy companions and all. But, you know, each one of the, the proverbial good people, and I would say probably everyone who's on this call is at least there in the mystical life, you know, has to go through that eye of the needle relationally with God and allow God to help each one of us cultivate a sensitivity to what it is that God wants for us, with us, and in us. And that includes in our world. And that is not an easy space to inhabit. So you're on to something, Dan. That's why we need each other in the journey as well, though. This might be a good time also, we're having a good conversation, but maybe to transition into questions that folks may have. Um, so I'm going, I know Ashley was there ready to collect any questions that might have arrived, uh, and I don't see any yet, but they might come. While, while we're waiting for a question, uh, I have a question for Jillian. So I, I know very much your very deep knowledge of Teresa, and I'd like to see if I could get you to talk a little bit more about Jillian of Norwich. And the reason I'm doing that is a really uh, one of the points that you made in your presentation was that gentleness can be a reminder of the presence of God. And where I'm going with in terms of relating that to Julian is that I think for some of us, and I, I say for myself, especially when I was a younger person growing up in the church, I uh, had this view of that, namely, God has some really high expectations of me. And when I mess up, God's really not happy with me. God's angry. There's punishment. There's punishment for sin. Um, and so this notion of, you know, kind of an angry God who's not happy because I'm not living up to it. And I think about, for me, for example, Julian and how she deals with this notion of, of sin or fallenness. Is it because of, namely, we're rebellious folks and God is angry at us? Or is it a whole different way of how God responds to us when we don't live up to the mark? And I don't know if you'd like to comment on that. Oh, that's great. Well, I want to, first of all, thank you for the question. And I'm not, I can't assume that everyone is familiar with Julian of Norwich, but I would definitely recommend if you would like to explore a, a book of some real potency, you know, some theological depth, but not, but very, very approachable, her showings, and I really like the Paulus Press edition of that, is really worth looking at. Julia Norwich lived during the time of the Black Death, and that makes her situation and her context so relevant to us today, having just lived through our own version of a pandemic, which really was one of the most probably shocking experiences that most of us have had in our own lifetime. And in Julian's time, of course, the more the kind of traditional way of thinking about a calamity in life was that, my gosh, God must be punishing us. What have we done wrong? And so there were many, uh, many of Julian of Orange's, uh, you know, um, contemporaries understood the Black Death and the pandemic to be something, an expression of the wrath of God, which I think you are kind of, you know, suggesting that some of us were raised with a God who, if was, if if this God was not wrathful, at least you know, was uh, wanted justice and demanded justice, and so we were always reminded of our incompetence, of our inadequacy, of our, you know, whatever, all of the things that, you know, we are on some level. Um, but Julian showed her contemporaries a very, very different kind of God, a tender God, a God who understood our vulnerability and who demonstrated that understanding of vulnerability in the companionate ways that Jesus walked with people and suffered. And it was that, um, that Julian's sense that God suffers with us um, that really helped open up insights into the tenderness and the, she says, God does not disdain to come to us in, the, in our humblest need. That's like, 
chapter three. I mean, it's like page five of her showings. It's such a radical and powerful sense. God does not disdain to come to us in our humblest of needs. You know, that to know that we have that kind of a God is a game changer. You know, we're, we're beholden to mystics for showing us what an incarnate God is really like. We say we believe in an incarnate God. Well, what does that mean? It means that God shares every single vulnerability of humanity and doesn't need a lesson from us about what we suffer and about what, you know, how uncomfortable it can be to be human, but rather God is with us in all of those spaces of vulnerability and need and passion and everything else. So I don't know if I really answered your question, Bill, or... Um, um. No, I agree. I agree with you that namely, um, yes, you have answered my question. And just to underline what Julian said that um, Julian is not an easy read, but there, if you are a patient person, I think you'll find really deep riches in terms, I would say for myself, the way that she has this very different approach in terms of, you know, what was the fall, you know, what was the, the, the fault of humanity at the beginning that we call original sin? And how does God respond to that? which uh, I think in many ways is really revolutionary and also very life-giving. Jillian, there, uh, there is a question here for you, which I think is a really good one. So the series has invited us to consider our images and names for God and how they may be changing. Can you tell us how your names for God in prayer have evolved as you have moved more deeply into the mystical life? Oh boy, talk about being put on the spot and we're recording this no less. Oh boy. Um, actually, people who know me and who have heard me pray or, uh, you know, in, in private or, you know, in companionate spaces or even in community know that my, that my kind of go-to name for God is capital D, dear, capital O one, dear one, um, the one who is dearest to me. Um, and that's been a kind of constant for, I would say, at least 20, maybe 25 years. It didn't happen overnight. Um, but that's kind of my go-to name for God. Um, go-to names that are not um, my go-to names for God have um, gender attached to them. I don't typically use he or she. Um, all my students, 30 years worth of students would know that about me. Um, so, uh, words that are a little more familiar, um, but certainly words that, uh, Holy One, capital H, capital O, um, the spirit, um, who is constantly stirring things up. I'm often, often aware of God's laughter. Um, and, uh, I even sometimes am, um, not necessarily uncomfortably aware of God laughing at me. Um, because when God laughs at me, it's never mean. <laughs> it, it's I, I can be a very, some of you may know, I can be a somewhat serious person, an intense person. And when God gets me to laugh with God at me, it's, it's wonderful. Um, so I do tend to have a very familiar sense of God. And I don't even necessarily use all that many names for God because I, I, I just feel god as a living part of me at this point thank you very much jillian i i see that we're at about time so in addition to thanking jillian for being here and for sharing her reflections i also want to thank the planning committee for getting us organized tonight and that's donna park linda finke janet neidhart kelly albini crosby jane myers and ashley thuring as well as the sponsorship of the institute for spirituality and social justice this presentation was recorded and will be made available on the Bellarmine YouTube page. Our next session will be on March 16th, entitled Revealing the Divine in Art and Music, with uh, Kathy Stockman and Scott Buzza, and it'll run a little bit longer. So it's going to start as our time has traditionally been at 7 o'clock, and it'll run to about 8.45 that evening. In addition, kind of as a, a special treat, those of you who are registered uh, for the series, uh, about a few days before the 16th, will get an email 
that will include some music, some listening material that you're not required to listen to, but uh, the presenters thought it, you might really enjoy listening to some music that they have in mind that they want to share on the 16th and to listen to it before the 16th. Also, please consider joining us for the April 2nd retreat, Multiplying Our Images of God, which will be facilitated by Xavier alum, Brian Shercliffe, at, here on Xavier's campus at the Health United building, so the hub. The retreat will take place from nine in the morning until noon, and we look forward to seeing you then. And of course, are very thankful and grateful for your presence this evening and for the sharing that you've done both in small group and in large group. Um, on behalf of the whole planning team, we wish you a great night. And I'll appeal to Ashley or Donna, if there's something that I have forgotten, they can chime in and say, you forgot something. But uh, I thought it was really a very uh, wonderful evening and rich material for us to reflect on and to find ways to weave it into our lives. So thank you very much, everyone. Thanks have so much, Julian. Thanks, Thanks for having me in. Have a great week, great weekend. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.